after after listening today, if you have questions uh, about your lawn, uh, not only today or this summer or whenever you might have a, a question regarding your lawn, um, here's some different ways to contacting me, uh, email. Uh, you're likely to get a faster response if you uh, text me. So there's my cell phone number. Um, and uh, any kind of problems, weeds, whatever, you know, just questions about what to do with your lawn, um, more than happy to uh, help answer those questions. So, uh, so uh, something I like to start off uh, talking about um, are, are some of the uh, the benefits that lawns uh, provide um, uh, to a society, to us personally in our lives. Um, uh, just what 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 do we get from lawns? Why why even bother having a lawn? And uh, uh, you know there there are a whole bunch of reasons. I'm not going to go through these uh, point by point, but uh, there are very definite environmental benefits: uh, cooling and filtering water and and uh, absorbing sound. Um, you know those kinds of things that that lawns will do for our environment. Um, uh, carbon fixation. So uh, uh, lawns can store a lot of carbon and taking uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And I think all of us know, have heard about uh, uh, potential problems with that. Um, but also great places to play if you're a kid or a dog or, or uh, even an adult. Um, and, and so, you know, plus a, a nice looking lawn is it, it's got an aesthetic appeal uh, as part of your landscape. So lots of, uh, Lots of benefits uh, uh, to lawns. You know, it's good exercise mowing your lawn and, and, and doing that type of thing. So uh, there are a lot of benefits um, uh, to having uh, uh, lawns in our environment, even though we do have to water them a little bit. Um, we like to say that the return on investment for that, that small amount of water is uh, pretty substantial. So that was my pitch for uh, why lawns are, are good to have and, and and why we should continue to have lawns. Uh, so what's it, what does it take to have a nice lawn in Colorado? Uh, a lot of us have moved here from somewhere else and most likely it's a place where it, it rains more than it does here. So uh, that's often one of the first um, uh, questions or um, uh, problems that people run into when they move to Colorado is, uh, wow, I never watered a lawn in New York or Florida or wherever they came from. Um, and if it didn't rain, it might turn a little bit brown, but then it would rain again and they didn't worry that much about it. So, um, uh, so certainly there's the question of, of, uh, of watering, but there are a lot of other things um, uh, that we have to do properly uh, to uh, have a nice looking lawn in Colorado. And one of them is, you know, if you are ever having the, the opportunity to uh, build a new house, and so have that new landscape or you do a landscape renovation, uh, choosing the grass that you put in that lawn wisely can make lawn care a whole lot easier uh, going going forward. But a lot of us don't have that opportunity or we don't want to go through the hassle of changing our lawn. So we're kind of stuck with the, the lawn species that uh, was planted there uh, in, the lawn, in the house before we bought it or before we moved into it. But certainly mowing, watering, fertilizing, um, managing something called thatch, which is uh, not uncommon with Kentucky bluegrass lawns, maybe a little bit of pest management, but we are pretty lucky in Colorado in that because of our low humidity and the fact that we really can't control how much water we put on our lawns, uh, that does reduce the, uh, the number of, uh, of uh, pest problems that we, we have on lawns um, and the severity of them when, when they do occur. Whereas uh, back in the Midwest and the East and the Southeast where it's very humid and it rains a lot. Now there are way more, more uh, disease and insect and uh, even weed problems than we encounter in lawns in the, the more arid part of the, uh, the United States. So places like Utah, Colorado, uh, Wyoming, uh, New Mexico uh, are really pretty good climates for uh, having healthy lawns and it can make lawn care a whole lot easier. <clears throat> Something I also like to start out with is, is, and this this is this really holds true for Colorado is uh, most of our lawn problems that we we run into um, are related to a little bit of mismanagement, and quite often it's it's a watering problem, too much, too little, uh, poor irrigation coverage, uh, 
those type of things. But it could also be mowing your lawn too short or not frequently enough or fertilizing at the wrong time of the year. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is uh, the very basic lawn management practices. How do you perform those so that you make your lawn as healthy as possible, as drought resistant as possible. And, and really along the way use um, uh, uh, less fertilizer, fewer or maybe no pesticides at all for the pest problems um, and still have a beautiful lawn. So, so that's, that's the plan for today. One kind of overriding fact though you see you'll find as we go through this is that the way we irrigate often influences uh, the type of problems we have. It may, if we water too much, we may have to mow and fertilize more than we'd want to, or we may have more of certain weed problems or whatever uh, the case might be. So, so a lot of our management is related to uh, the way that we irrigate. And quite often, that's either too much or too little. Uh, and getting it just right uh, does require a little bit of work on the part of the, uh, of the homeowner. But we'll talk about irrigation and how to do it more efficiently. So one of the, uh, uh, and, and the most um, um, labor intensive part of, of, of lawn care is the mowing part. Um, and generally you're not gonna get away from mowing if you have a lawn. Um, you know, some grasses grow more slowly than others. Buffalo grass, you could probably mow it once every two or three weeks and it's gonna be fine. Whereas a bluegrass lawn, you probably have to mow it every two or once or twice a week. Uh, especially in the spring when it's really um, uh, growing fast. So uh, the mowing is the, the, the part of lawn care that some people love mowing, others it's like their least favorite part of lawn care. But in any case, it is a necessity of uh, most lawns. Uh, one of the keys for uh, mowing your lawn properly is to mow it as, as tall as you can, as you can uh, tolerate. So if your lawnmower will setting can go up to four inches, that's better than mowing it at three inches, which is better than mowing it at two inches. And one of the reasons for that is that the, the shorter we mow the grass, the shallower the root system gets. And then that makes the lawn less drought resistant and less tolerant of disease and insect problems. And it makes it less competitive against weeds. So uh, the deeper your root system is, the, the sturdier, the more stress tolerant that grass plant's going to be and the way we get deep roots or one way is to mow as tall um, as we can tolerate. And I just wanted to show this picture that uh, uh, taller mowing um, can also be one of your cheapest weed control products. It's something you don't even have to go and buy and apply to the lawn. So uh, here's a, a lawn that, that was mowed at two different heights. This is a research study I did a number of years ago. And I mo simply mowed it at three inches or one and a half inches. And wherever we mowed it at one and a half inches, we had a lot more uh, crabgrass and foxtail and other weeds growing in that turf. And under the taller mowing height, there was virtually no weeds at all. And this is all without uh, applying any kind of uh, uh, pesticides, any kind of herbicides. This was simply the mowing effect on, on weeds. So uh, taller mowing is a form of weed control. Uh, another uh, uh, aspect of mowing is to mow frequently enough so that you don't, you're not really kind of scalping the lawn, leaving those big clumps of the grass clippings everywhere. And I realize sometimes that happens when it rains and we do get rainy periods sometimes here in Colorado where it might rain for a week and it's hard uh, take it out and mow your lawn, but um, it, if whenever possible, it's always better to mow your lawn about every five days rather than every seven days. I know a lot of people mow their lawn every Saturday morning. It's a Saturday ritual or it could be a Thursday afternoon, whatever the case might be. But if you can do it every five days, the lawn is going to be a whole lot healthier Yeah, if you do it once a week. So another aspect of mowing is to leave the grass clippings on the lawn. It's free fertilizer, it's free organic matter. There's no reason to remove those grass clippings. They don't cause thatch. Um, if you do apply any pesticides to your lawn, um, you're putting those pesticides right back into the turf system, which is where they belong. Um, you're not filling up landfills with 
you know, something that, that's really good organic matter for your landscape. Now, if you do like to uh, save grass clippings and, and make compost out of them or use them uh, for mulching your lawn, or, or I mean, your vegetable garden, uh, that, that's, that's a good thing. But uh, otherwise leave those grass clippings on the lawn. And as long as you mow your lawn frequently enough, you're not really gonna notice those grass clippings very much. Uh, another important aspect of uh, mowing is keeping your mower blade sharp. And it's not quite a scissors action. Uh, when you're mowing your lawn, it's basically, it's that, that lawnmower, that rotary mower blade hitting the, the, the leaves at a very high speed. And if that mower blade is even remotely sharp, it's going to cut it pretty cleanly. But when mower blades get really dull, uh, it, they can start to tear the leaf uh, blades. Then you get this brown uh, cast on the lawn. Uh, doesn't make it look very nice. So is it really a problem for the lawn to mow the lawn with a dull mower blade? Not really, uh, but it just doesn't look as nice. And uh, so keep your mower blade sharp. And you know, if you, mow, if you sharpen your blade once a year, that's pretty good. Uh, you know, probably monthly is better, uh, but uh, once a year is often all we can ask for people to do it. Uh, avoid mowing a, a, a stress lawn. So when your lawn needs to be watered, it might be, you know, I'll show you pictures as soon where lawns get a little drought stress and they start getting kind of a funky blue color to them and you can see footprints in the lawn. Uh, mowing a lawn when it's drought stress can end up causing this problem. Um, some people call mower blight, uh, but this is simply the, the leaf blades were um, wilting due to lack of water. And then the, the added pressure and stress of mowing, of walking on that lawn, of pushing the mower on the lawn caused it to uh, uh, turn brown in strips where the wheel marks were, for example. So that grass is not dead, it will grow back. It might take it two or three weeks to grow back, but it will grow back, it'll be fine. So don't feel like you have to resod the lawn that you've killed the lawn when this happens. Don't, mow, don't blame the mowing company. They didn't bring disease onto the lawn. This is uh, simply, uh, the lawn was mowed when it should have been watered and uh, mowed the next day. So. so I'll stop real quickly, see if there's any questions. And, and uh, something I was going to say is um, um, if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat um, and I'll, I'll answer any of those questions. But I don't see anything in there, so I will forge on ahead. But if you do Think your questions later relative to mowing or anything else. Um, simply uh, put those into the uh, chat or the Q and A, and um, and I'll look at those occasionally and try to answer those. Okay, let's talk about fertilizing a home lawn. Um, uh, this is something I think people make overly complicated, but it's because when you go to the garden center, or you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, and you're you're looking at all these bags of fertilizer and different companies and different numbers and different claims. And um, they all claim to be the best. And what I tell people, if there's a best fertilizer, there would only be one on the market. So, uh, you know, it's just like, it's just like buying, you know, you know breakfast cereal. Uh, there's all kinds and people have different preferences and they all kind of accomplish the same thing is basically giving you lots of sugar that you don't need probably. No, just kidding. Uh, there, are, there are healthy ones out there, uh, but actually the, the analogy isn't, isn't uh, far off for fertilizers. Uh, there are some fertilizers that used incorrectly can be kind of like giving your lawn a sugar high, uh, which it doesn't need. So uh, one of the keys there is whatever fertilizer you do decide to buy for your lawn is to follow the instructions, which usually involves spreader uh, settings uh, either a number or a letter for whatever kind of spreader you have. And uh, the key there is to not over apply the fertilizer and or to apply it at the wrong time of the year. So uh, something that's important to know though is that uh, you know there's all kinds of numbers and stuff on those bags and the numbers change from one company to the next, whether it's Scott's or Vigoro or whatever the case might be. Um, but the first number is the important one and that's uh, the, the uh, percentage of nitrogen in that bag. And it doesn't even have to be a high number. Um, it's just important that there is a number in that first that first number. And it could be a six, 
it could be a 10, it could be a 27, it could be a 45 or 46. Um, and that's just the percent by weight of nitrogen in that bag. And so the higher the number goes, the less you need to apply to your lawn to get a fertilizer effect. The lower the number is, um, the more of that stuff in the bag you have to apply to your lawn to get a fertilizer effect. So that's why, that's why following the instructions is really, really important because it's too easy to apply too much or not enough if you're not reading the instructions. Um, some other things about fertilizing your lawn though is that the older your lawn is, and if you've been recycling your grass clippings for years and years and years, you can probably get away with fertilizing that lawn maybe one time a year. Um, but if you've got a lawn that's one or two years old and a brand new housing addition, new HOA, horrible soil, um, maybe they didn't do soil prep very well, that lawn may very well need to be fertilized four times a year. So, you know, so those the advertisements on TV for the, like the Scott's four-step program, you know, are those necessary? No, not really. Uh, for most lawns, they're not necessary. And the Scott's company won't like me saying that. Um, but if you've got commercial lawn care, you may not need four applications of fertilizer a year on your lawn. You may be perfectly fine with one or two. Um, and again, lawn care companies don't like me saying that, but that's that's the truth. In general, the older your lawn, and by old, I mean if it's old, older than 10 or 15 years, and certainly a 20, 30, or 40 year old lawn, um, those, those really old lawns, one time a year is probably sufficient for fertilizing. Um, the species makes a difference. Buffalo grass lawns, you can probably fertilize a buffalo grass lawn once every couple of years and we'll be happy. Whereas bluegrass or ryegrass lawns need probably at least once a year. So, um, so there's there's a lot of variables there. And and uh, you know if you have questions about you know your lawn and when to fertilize it, and uh, you, you have my email and and uh, uh, cell number there, you can text me a, a, a quick question. I'll help you to answer it. The thing is, is the lawn will tell you when it needs fertilizer or not. Um, if you can see to the property line where your lawn, your neighbor's lawn is really dark green and yours isn't, or vice versa, um, that's usually an indicator that the lawn needs to be fertilized. Um, and sometimes we can see certain weeds come into lawns that aren't fertilized enough, especially clover. White clover is a very common weed in lawns that don't receive enough nitrogen. On the other hand, lawns that are overly fed, they're pampered and, and fed too much and frequently and especially if they're watered too much and fertilized too much, they can get this disease called the necrotic ring spot. So, so certain, certain problems can be indicators of, uh, of uh, uh, too much or not enough, not, not enough fertilizer uh, going out to the lawn. So uh, as, as in most things in life, a moderation is the key when it comes to fertilizing. This just so though, um, if you don't fertilize enough, um, you can have more weed problems than if you fertilize adequately. So again, a uh, taller mowing height and then adequate fertilization can be a very good weed management tools for your lawn. You know, the timing your fertilizer it depends on what kind of lawn you have. So if you've got a cool season lawn, uh, so like a Kentucky bluegrass or a tall fescue or a fine fescue lawn, uh, maybe a little bit in the spring, maybe not so much in the summer. Um, and then in the fall, we emphasize fertilizing again. So it's kind of avoiding the really hot time of the year, that July, August period. We, we really don't want to put a lot of fertilizer on the turf at that time of the year, unless you've got a lawn where maybe you've got big dogs, you got two or three Labrador retrievers, or you got a bunch of kids that come over and play in your lawn every day. If you've got a very high activity lawn, you'll probably need to fertilize even in June and July and August to keep that grass growing to recover from the traffic. But if it's a purely ornamental lawn and the only traffic he gets is when you mow, um, you probably don't have to fertilize much past uh, the middle of June until sometime in September. So uh, learning what kind of lawn you have is an important first step and that can be tricky. Uh, although this time of year, if you've got a buffalo grass lawn, which I talk about here, and it's fertilized totally differently. So a buffalo grass lawn, you, you fertilize in the middle of summer, kind of July, early August, maybe late June, that period. 
and you don't fertilize in the spring and you don't fertilize in the fall. Um, this is why it's important to know what kind of lawn you have. But if you have a buffalo grass lawn now, it's not even close to green. All of your neighbor's lawns are green and yours is totally straw colored brown. Uh, you probably have a buffalo or a blue grama lawn. Do not fertilize it now. If you fertilize it now, it just encourages weeds to grow in that lawn. As I stated before, there's no best fertilizer. It's whatever you like. Maybe you own stock in the Scots company, um, or that's what your parents used to fertilize your lawn when you were a kid. Uh, you know, whatever reason, whatever reason you have brand loyalty. Um, there's all kinds of companies out there, all kinds of brands of fertilizer. There's natural, there's organic, uh, there's synthetic. Um, when it comes down to is the plant doesn't care. Your, your lawn doesn't care how you, what kind of fertilizer you apply, just so long as you apply the correct amount at the correct time of the year. Those are the really uh, important parts of fertilizing. Um, and, and then again, follow the instructions on the bag. Those instructions will generally have spreader settings. It'll say, if you've got a drop spreader, and notice this company's got all of these different brands of drop spreaders, from the Sears to the Scots to the Orthos, um, all those different types. Um, and those different types, you can see, will have vastly different um, uh, spreader settings to put the correct amount of fertilizer out. Same thing for the broadcast spreader. So follow the instructions on the bag so that you put the correct amount on. Okay, so any uh, questions on, um, on fertilizing? Don't see any in the chat or in the Q&A. So again, as we go forward and you think of one, perhaps on uh, fertilizing, uh, we can address that. So uh, next part of lawn care is the watering part and there's going to be a, this this one's going to take a little this part will take a little longer than the fertilizing and mowing part um so watering a lawn uh pretty much is a necessity in colorado if you especially if you've got a bluegrass lawn now if you have a buffalo grass lawn and that that's that's what i have i have a buffalo grass lawn i've had one for 30 years and i i can't remember the last time if ever that i watered that lawn i, I just don't it could be 20 years ago when my kids were still at home and I needed to get a little recovery that I watered that buffalo grass. But otherwise, it just does not get watered. And that, you know, buffalo grass is a native grass here in the front range of Colorado. That's his blue grandma. And you go walk on the Pawnee grasslands or up north here, Fort Collins and some of the, um, the natural areas. And you can see uh, acres and acres of buffalo grass that only gets nat native precipitation and it does fine. So, so some grass species can do great without any supplemental irrigation, but most of the grasses that we plant in home lawns in Colorado will need irrigation to keep them green. Um, so how do you teach people to irrigate? Um, you know, you can, you can try the cookbook approach and this is, here's a, a, a graphic. <clears throat> I, I created this with the city of Fort Collins a number of years ago too provide some guidance to people on, on how to water their lawns and to point out some important uh, considerations in lawn watering that a lot of people just didn't think about. Um, and these are in no order of, of importance on this graphic, but I wanna point these out to you. Um, and if you want a copy of this, send me an email and I'll send you the, uh, the uh, graphic. Uh, it's a PDF and you can print it and hang it on your refrigerator if you want, or in the garage by your irrigation controller. Uh, but this is, uh, this is kind of as close as I can get to a cookbook approach to a watering a lawn. And you can fine tune it from here. But uh, the first thing to realize is that uh, we generally have two types of irrigation heads um, in home lawn irrigation systems. The pop-up sprays are the ones that just uh, pop up and they don't turn, there's no movement. They just spray a lot of water and then they go back down into the ground. Whereas uh, the ones that we call rotors, um, they come out of the ground and they turn. There's a physical movement of the uh, of the spray of that of that sprinkler head. Uh, variation on that is what we call stream rotors, uh, kind of the fingers of um, of water. And actually, my first graphic, this this is what we call a stream rotor. And these things 
they look like they turn. Okay. Uh, but um, they, uh, uh, they're really stationary. There's just a little gear inside that head that turns. Uh, but the difference in those two types of heads is that this pop-up sprays, put a lot of water out in a very short amount of time. Whereas the ones that turn or have motion put out water very, very slowly. So um, you have to run and you can see by the, the run times here. So uh, a, a spray head in May may need 12 minutes of total run time, whereas the, the uh, rotors or stream rotors may need 32 minutes of total run time. So almost three times uh, longer run times with the, the rotor type heads versus the spray heads. Very important to remember. And that's, this is why we don't, we don't uh, uh, mix irrigation head types on the same irrigation station because you'll end up with either really, really wet spots or really, really dry spots, depending on how long you run that station. Okay. Uh, the other part to, uh, realize, to recognize here is that as we go through the season from May through October, that as we get into the warmer times of the, the year, we're going to irrigate more, so longer irrigation events. And we're going to perhaps irrigate more often during the week. So maybe once a week in May, maybe three times a week in July and August when it's really hot and dry and sunny. So, And then the other takeaway from this graphic is that we encourage what we call soak cycling. Soak cycling is uh, instead of putting on uh, 20 minutes of water in July, you break it up into two run times of say 10 minutes, okay? Or in the case of the rotors, instead of doing 40 minutes at once, you do 20 minutes twice, separated by maybe a couple of hours. And most of the, the new irrigation clocks can handle that type of what we call soak cycling. Um, what that does is it promotes a better water infiltration, less runoff into the street or um, into the, uh, the, the storm sewer, um, less puddling, so low spots in your lawn, you don't have wet spots and, and dry spots. So that soak cycling um, really does improve the uh, efficiency of irrigation. So, so those are the three takeaways, different, different spray uh, sprinkler types, adjust your irrigation, during the growing season, um, and then uh, use uh, soak cycles to uh, get better efficiency. Um, so, a way to a way to take this information, this cookbook, and make it even more refined, is to run your irrigation system manually. So instead of just putting it on an autopilot, and we call that set it and forget it. Um, so some people, they will. They will set their, their irrigation uh, system like it's July, but they're watering using July uh, run times in May. As you can see that would grossly over irrigate your lawn. And those are the lawns sometimes that we start seeing um, some of our, our more common turf diseases. There's when people do July watering in May, or it could be the opposite. You do May watering in July and August, and that little amount of water is not enough to keep the grass alive. And people are wondering why they have wilty and brown grass. And it's because they haven't adjusted their run times uh, seasonally. So uh, don't just set it and forget it. Some very sophisticated um, uh, irrigation clocks will seasonally adjust on their own if you allow them to. Um, so it depends on the sophistication of the, uh, of the uh, irrigation clock. Uh, but certainly, with any irrigation controller, what you can do is run it manually. So this means turning it into off. And this is what I call my easy lawn watering technique. It's where you look at the lawn, you have it tell you when it needs to be watered. You put a bunch of water on, you really don't care how much, just so it's a, a really good soaking. And then you don't water again until you see the signs of stress again. So some people like to look for the color changes. You kind of get this blue green look. Some people like the footprinting. Um, and this, these are pictures of footprinting where the grass is wilty and those, those leaves don't spring back. They don't have enough water in them to spring back um, and stand up perfectly straight. So 
that's a sign that the, the turf is wilting and in need of water probably that night. Um, but the whole point of the easy lawn watering is to um, uh, really minimize the set it and forget it aspect of, of watering. Um, and so it's applying the appropriate amount of water um, or, or frequency and putting as much water as you can and not wait and then waiting again until the lawn tells you that it needs to be watered. So it's a it's a, a lawn by lawn, a case by case situation. So this is the hardest one to um, uh, to determine. So you turn your clock off, you watch for signs of wilt, and then you put a bunch of water on, maybe a half inch, one, one inch of water. Then you don't water again until you start seeing the signs of wilt. And here's another sign of wilt where you can see kind of very bright green, and then you start to see kind of brownish or off color spots in your lawn. That's a sign that that entire lawn eventually needs to be watered. So this easy lawn watering technique does require you to, to pay attention to your lawn. That's, that's, I guess, I mean, a good thing if you're a lawn geek, but if you're not into your lawns and you're much rather be doing other things and you don't want to think about watering your lawn, maybe this easy lawn watering technique isn't the best approach for you. That may be the set it and forget it. Or as I'll show you a little bit later, getting a smart controller is a better approach. So, so just some basic tips of um, uh, uh, watering a lawn to, just to save a little bit of water. But if you do each of these, those little bits can add up to quite a bit of water savings in a lawn. Um, you know, water in the cooler parts of the night or evening, uh, you know, the optimal time is probably three or four in the morning if you want to do something like that. Uh, but also check for irrigation uh, uh, coverage problems. A lot of times what people will do is they'll turn up the irrigation system to water enough that they get rid of all their brown spots. When if they adjusted some heads, uh, raised some heads, fixed some plugged um, uh, nozzles, that type of thing, just did some routine maintenance on their irrigation system, they could eliminate those brown spots and apply less water. Um, so. So compensating for poor irrigation system management isn't really the best approach to uh, uh, saving water. So these are all examples of poor coverage. Um, you know, some, so some people would say, oh, I got disease on my lawn and it's, it's very rarely do you have disease uh, and this is not disease. But when these heads came up, this is what they all look like. Um, so they were all pointed, um, in places they shouldn't have been pointing. And as a result, um, we got very poor irrigation coverage resulting in brown grass. One way to convince yourself that it's an irrigation coverage problem because people will turn this, their irrigation head on and say, see, I told you it can't be water. It's gotta be something else. Um, so what I do to convince people that this, this system is not covering um, uniformly or adequately is I take these, uh, uh, little containers, catch cups, and I put some on the green parts of the lawn, some in the brown parts. I run the system for a while, and then we go back and we measure how much water is in each of these. Now, they don't have to be fancy cups. Uh, they can be, you know, mason jars, uh, plastic drinking cups, um, cat food cans, yogurt containers, um, anything. Uh, but use the same ones. Use similar um, uh, uh, containers when you're doing this. I just do these because it's easier to show people um, application, right? Um, but on this lawn, what I showed was just a few feet difference between this brown spot and this green spot was twice as much water. Now it was a tenth of an inch of water. And you say, well, that's only a tenth of an inch difference. That's not much. But the other way to look at that is twice as, twice as much water. And you start multiplying that over an entire growing season, multiple years of not getting uh, sufficient water. And that's a pretty good explanation for why there's no grass growing in here, is that the irrigation coverage uh, was so bad, even though it looks so good, it looks pretty good. Um, it was so bad that the grass just gives up. When it can't get enough water, it's gonna die out. So, so don't take the word of your, uh, people say, oh, my irrigation guy came in, he, he turned the system on, he said everything was perfect. I, I always ask, well, did he measure out, 
output of, of any of the, the heads. And they go, no, they just turn the system on and look at it. And that is the worst way to determine if your irrigation system is operating properly. So again, this uh, uh, easy lawn watering technique, what it does is it, it takes away the set it and forget it. Um, you start doing this kind of naturally, this, this, uh, this watering technique, and, um, and you can, you can uh, save quite a bit of water by uh, putting your irrigation system on manual and just watching for when the turf needs to be watered. Another kind of fun, or not fun, but very effective uh, tune-up you can do with an irrigation system is again, understanding that we've got different types of irrigation heads you can put in the lawn. Um, so something you could do is if your irrigation system was installed with pop-up sprays, these type of heads, and you want to switch to rotors or stream rotors, um, this can help with, um, if you've got a very slopey lawn, if you've got wet spots, dry spots, what, what, what happens with the, uh, using the rotors or the stream rotors is that you get much slower water application rate. So you get more water or more uniform infiltration into the lawn. So uh, you end up with a, essentially a greener lawn, even though you're putting water out uh, much more slowly um, with the different types of heads. So um, one of the easiest switches though, is these pop-up sprays to the stream rotors. And in fact, it's so easy that you can, this is a do it yourself thing. You can do it in really a couple hours um, in your own home landscape. And the bonus is depending on which municipality you live in, you can get a rebate um, on the cost of these uh, new nozzles. So, so it's not replacing the entire head. You don't replace the entire head. All you do is you replace the little nozzle that screws into the head. Um, so it's a super easy thing to do. And um, it's not necessarily cheap. You can see the head or the nozzles here um, are about $9 a piece. So that can add up a little bit. You know, you got 10, 10 nozzles or something, you're talking about a hundred bucks uh, to get the new nozzling. But if you're in a, in a city, a municipality where you can get the rebate uh, for the cost of those, um, uh, it can be a pretty good investment. Now, another thing you can do is invest in a very uh, kind of a high-end irrigation controller. And what I want to tell you about here is something uh, we call these smart controllers. Uh, but this, this uh, uh, company, the Rachio uh, company, and this is, uh, uh, you can find them on Amazon, they, but they've got their, their own website, Rachio.com. Uh, this is a Denver-based company. So this is a made in Colorado product that's not made outside the United States and shipped here. Um, it, is, it is manufactured and made in Colorado, which is for, for many people, that's a, a huge selling point. It's also an excellent controller and you can see by the very high Amazon ratings. And, and as you all know, um, Amazon can be a brutal place when it comes to uh, product evaluations. And so the fact that this, this is a, a very highly rated uh, a controller by all those people that bought the controller. That's a good sign. Uh, I was just in Costco the other day and they, they I saw them be, these being sold in Costco, uh, at least up here in Fort Collins as well. So um, these are readily available. They're one of the few uh, controllers that are, are EPA water sense certified. So this is kind of like the Energy Star rating on refrigerators and dryers and you know appliances that you buy buy for your home. Um, the, this is the equivalent of Energy Star for water application equipment. Is the EPA Water Sense, um, and that certifies that the claims that the company makes for water savings are are justified and are something that that you as a homeowner could uh, could uh, experience. Uh, something else you can do with your irrigation system, you can get this technology today, is by soil moisture sensor. And so what this, these things do is they turn the system on and off independently of you uh, based on the level of moisture present in the soil. Um, some are wireless. The, the Toro company has a wireless one. 
the rainbird and hunter versions are um, uh, hardwired into your system. But uh, uh, certainly another way of reducing the amount of, of water that, uh, that you apply to your lawn and still have a nice quality lawn. Here's the thing though, all that cool technology, the smart controller, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the soil moisture sensors, uh, these, these two, they will not correct poor irrigation coverage. Now, switching out your irrigation heads can help with that. Uh, but certainly buying a controller or buying a soil moisture sensor is not going to fix a problem like this. Sometimes switching from a stream rotor, from a, a pop-up spray to a stream rotor can fix some problems. But really, uh, you've got to get your, your nozzles so they come up out of the ground straight, that they're not plugged, uh, that they're not broken, that they're turning. Uh, make sure that those heads are performing uh, adequately. Um, and then, yeah, maybe investing in a smart controller can be a really, really smart thing or a soil moisture sensor or both. So there are ways that you can uh, very uh, effectively water your lawn and minimize the amount of water that you put on that lawn. Here's another neat little trick. I use this one on HOAs all the time because they tend to really, really over irrigate their, their lawns. Um, but also their perennial beds too. Every, everything in an HOA tends to get overwatered, it seems. Um, but here's something that uh, be before they go through the expense of like getting a smart controller and converting their turf to something else, I always suggest, um, you know, change your run times by one or two minutes. Um, so I'm gonna go back to this graphic here. Where is it? I've missed, uh, well, anyway, um, uh, we're, we're here it is. Sorry to make you dizzy there, but if you, if you reduce a run time by one minute, so what we're saying here is if you, if you reduce your total run time, uh, let's say by two minutes of this 16 minutes, that's uh, over 10% uh, water savings. And 1% uh, would be, or what, reducing it by one minute would be whatever one divided by 16, uh, probably about a 4% water savings. So um, just changing things by one or two minutes, your runtime, just reducing them by one or two minutes can save a huge amount of water. Um, and, and it's relatively painless and um, it's easy. And it's definitely cheap. Um, so that's kind of a nice little, a little, little little thing you can do, and then what happens if you if you find that you've reduced run times too much? It could be at a certain time of the year, or because of poor irrigation coverage, um, that um, uh, you'll start to see maybe some slight brown spots, and that that that's how you know you've reached the limit of cutting that that run those run times back, and then maybe add a minute back in just so you don't get real brown spots. So uh, this is this can be a real water saver, which translates into a real money saver. Okay, any questions in the chat on anything? No questions that I see. Okay. Okay, then I'll uh, go forward on to uh, uh, this is kind of soil management, what we call thatch management, and this is where uh, bluegrass lawns, and this is Kentucky bluegrasses, and this is kind of a cross section of a bluegrass lawn. Uh, you have your soil, uh, you have your grass, and a lot of times, especially in older bluegrass lawns, you'll have this layer of organic matter that builds up um, and forms in the, in the lawn. The problem with this, a little bit of thatch is okay, about a half an inch is okay, uh, because you get better wear tolerance. Uh, but when it gets to be one or two inches deep, this doesn't hold very much water. It's very porous. So the water runs through it. The soil down below gets really wet. Nutrients run through it. So it doesn't retain nutrients very well. The problem is that the roots start to grow in this because roots are lazy. And they're going to grow where it's easiest to grow. And it's way easier to grow in the thatch layer than it is in this underlying soil. Okay, Especially if the soil is compacted. So, so 
this is what thatch is. A little bit's good. A lot of it is not so good. And uh, you're going to end up having a lawn that you have to water and fertilize a lot if it gets very thatchy. And, uh, and by the way, it's not from grass clippings. So thatch is from stems. You can see these stems. These are rhizomes. So from stems and crowns, um, roots a little bit. Roots are a little, uh, they're longer lasting. They're very woody. And so they tend to accumulate too. So all those other plant parts, but not grass clippings. That, that, so leave your grass clippings on your lawn. They're not causing this problem. So how do you manage thatch? One way is to power rake your lawn, rent one of these machines, and this is kind of a spring ritual for some people. This can work perfectly well. Uh, can also be very damaging to the lawn. And the other thing is, is that it stirs up a lot of weed seeds. So if you do power rake your lawn, again, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with power raking, uh, but uh, realize that you probably should put a, a crabgrass, a pre-emerge crabgrass preventer on your lawn. Um, in the spring um, and if you do core culture or if you do power rake you should still aerate your lawn core cultivate it because a lot of times the reason thatch forms is because the soil is so hard that the roots don't want to grow into the soil they want to grow above it so even if you power rake this thatch away do some uh, aerating to make the soil a little bit better place for the roots to grow into rather than on top of the soil um, so what if you don't uh, power rake or if you do power rake and I just say you should you should do lawn aeration and this is uh, what we what, what I mean by aeration this is um, core cultivation this is pulling plugs with soil out of the lawn making holes um, and what this does is it helps reduce compaction uh, by putting some soil on top of, of the lawn that the soil breaks down moves into the thatch and then it starts to help the thatch kind of compost in site or in place. So you don't have to power rake. And the other thing you can see what happens is by making those holes, the roots grow down into the soil rather than on top of the soil. So you're encouraging deeper rooting with the uh, uh, core cultivation. So here's the thing you can do at spring or fall, you can do it spring and fall. Um, in the, think of twos, you want the, the holes to be about two, two inches deep and you want the holes to be about two inches apart. So two to three inches deep, two to three inches apart. Um, and that might mean going over the lawn two or three times by that person you hire to do the lawn aeration, but uh, that's what it takes to do a really good job of aerating a lawn. Um, there are scams out there, there are companies that will say they can do liquid lawn aeration, that they can just spray stuff on your lawn and it's gonna get rid of the thatch and it's gonna get rid of the soil compaction. I will tell you right now, don't waste your money on those. Um, they're, they're, they're a rip off, they're a waste of time. And if you've got a lawn care company that claims that they can take care of your aeration and thatch with a liquid application of something, um, they're ripping you off. Uh, and you can tell them I said that. So. Um, and you can give them my phone number if they want to discuss it. So these things don't work, but they sound too good to be true and people kind of fall for these. So uh, don't fall for those. Okay, I want to talk about weeds quickly because this is the time of year when we start to see weeds coming up in people's lawns um, and they have questions and the weeds become kind of less obvious to people as we get closer in the summer and certainly into the fall. So this time of year, we're already starting to see dandelions starting to bloom in lawns and funky grasses are growing in people's lawns and they want to call it crabgrass and it really isn't. Um, but why do we get weeds in lawns in the first place? The, the number one reason is that the turf gets weak or thin in, for some reason. Uh, it's worn out by the dog running around in the yard or digging. Uh, or you're not fertilizing enough, or you're mowing too short, and you can see bare soil. Um, you give Mother Nature bare soil and some water, and the end product is going to be weeds, guaranteed. Some kind of weed, a plant that you don't like, okay, especially growing in your lawn. Um, so sometimes we plant weeds, we get cheap grass seed, and I'll tell you right now, Lowe's and Home Depot are not the places to buy grass seed. You want to get grass seed from... Uh, a legitimate seed company. Now they will sell through our better garden centers like the 
again, here in Fort Collins, it's, uh, you know, Fort Collins Nursery or Bath um, um, or Jack's uh, Ranch uh, Supply aligns themselves with a good seed company. Um, or you can go to Greeley and buy uh, grass seed, a couple of good uh, uh, seed companies there. Uh, but don't don't get your grass seed in, in Lowe's or Home Depot, not the best place to buy it because you can be planting stuff you don't want to, including weeds. Um, but a lot of our weeds are due to mowing too short or watering too much and not fertilizing enough, all those type of things. And, and so the better cared for the lawn, like the one on the right versus the one on the left, the fewer weeds it's gonna have, so. Um, so some people, uh, they see really coarse, ugly weeds growing in their lawns and they say, oh, I got crabgrass. Well, crabgrass is not gonna germinate for about another maybe month now. And then it's going to be very tiny plants. So most people don't even start really seeing what is truly crabgrass in their lawns. Um, if, and this is if they're really looking closely, uh, probably still sometime in late, in, in mid, late June. Um, and then they start to see this grass that doesn't look right. Um, but you're not seeing crabgrass now. It's impossible. It hasn't germinated yet. Uh, same thing for goosegrass and foxtail and some of these other annual grassy weeds. Um, but a lot of people are seeing this right now. And this is something, I don't have the name on there. This is something called smooth brome grass. This is a perennial weed, uh, very coarse and ugly, wide bladed, grows really fast this time of year, greens up before all the other grasses do. And people say, oh, I got crabgrass. They run out and get crabgrass preventer and it doesn't do anything for this. And they say, oh, the product didn't work. Well, now it's because you haven't identified the weed properly. So a huge, huge, importantly, uh, hugely important part of weed management is identifying the weed so that you apply the right product or you use the right procedure to manage that weed. So, so this is where um, my cell phone comes in really handy is take a picture. And this is a picture somebody sent me and said, I think I have crabgrass. What do I spray for this? And I had to tell them, no, it's not crabgrass. So I can identify the grass from the picture just so it's a nice close up one like this or any kind of weed, okay? So send me those pictures and I'll tell you what the weed is and what to spray, what to go to the garden center or what to tell your lawn care person to uh, apply for. But certainly we are getting to the time of year when we can apply crabgrass preventer. Um, and I tell people look for forsythia blooming in your, in your neighborhood. So when you start seeing forsythia, and I've actually seen a few around Fort Collins starting to bloom, um, that can be a really good sign of when to apply a, a crabgrass preventer, crabgrass free emergent herbicide. Um, almost everything that's sold on the homeowner market is going to be one of these three. Uh, Scott sells their own, um, uh, Stay Green has their own, and Vigoro has their own. So Fertilome um, has their own. So these are the main ones. They're all really good. They all last a long time. Um, they're all fairly cheap. So any of those are good crabgrass preventers. But follow the instructions, just, just like with the fertilizing. In fact, most of them come on fertilizer. So you're fertilizing and putting crabgrass preventer down at the same time with these. Uh, if you do use a pre-immersion herbicide, time it correctly. If you wait until you see crabgrass, it's too late. If you go on too early, it doesn't last through the growing season. So uh, timing, and putting water on afterwards. Um, so timing it so, you know, maybe we're gonna get a nice spring snowstorm. Nothing in the forecast yet, um, but uh, seems like every Mother's Day we, we get snow for about the past four or five years. Uh, but timing your pre-emerge so that you can water it in, that might mean pulling a hose to sprinkle around if you don't have your irrigation system fired up. So, so keep that in mind, you have to water these in for them to work. Or you can wait until you see crabgrass and just say, okay, there's some good products out there to control crabgrass if it does come up in my, in my lawn. So anything that has this, this chemical in it called quinchloric, this is where you read the fine print, or look for plus crabgrass control, plus crabgrass control, crabgrass killer. Um, these things, um, these products control crabgrass post-emergent. They don't prevent it by seed, but they kill the crabgrass plant that you can actually see. So, so look for those if you do have some crabgrass come up 
because you haven't used a, a, a preventer. And, and a, word, a word on the preventer, if you have a really thick, healthy lawn, you don't need crabgrass preventer. But if your lawn's kind of suspect, it's not real healthy, you can see soil, um, it might be a good idea to do a, a, a crabgrass preventer this year. But then we've got all kinds of perennial weeds that it can be very ugly growing in a home lawn. Um, essentially, there's almost no options uh, for killing these without killing your existing turf. So you, this is a case where you learn to tolerate them. Oftentimes, they're really visible in the spring. And then as you get into more of the late spring and summer and fall and you're mowing more frequently, uh, those, lawn, those uh, perennial grassy weeds become less obvious. But you can send me pictures of those. And for a few of them, there are some selective controls that you could use to uh, manage them in your lawn. But otherwise, with the perennials, it's often a case of um, either digging them out, pulling them out, or spraying with Roundup, something like that to uh, kill the weed, and then maybe resod or reseed in that spot that you've killed off, So, or learn to tolerate it. The dicot weeds, dicots are like dandelions and clover and those kind of things, and plantain and thistle. Uh, we've got all kinds of great products uh, for those. There's a huge, huge, huge list. And actually something that I would, that I would tell you is um, um, the, uh, the ones that uh, have crabgrass preventer. Um, let me go back here. These are great on dandelions and thistle and plantain and clover. Um, so the the broad spectrum, uh, Weed Be Gone Max and Bear Advanced products and Roundup for Lawns. Roundup for Lawns is a great product. Some people are put off by the name. There's no Roundup in here. So the name of the company is Roundup. But the Roundup for Lawns, it makes a, make sure it says four lawns, four lawns, and this is what the label looks like. Um, this will kill weeds in your lawn without killing your grass. If you just spray Roundup on your lawn, it will kill everything, including your grass. So make sure you get the Roundup for lawns. Um, but it's good for uh, these kind of weeds too, these broadleaf weeds. If you don't like using traditional um, uh, uh, pesticides, uh, herbicides, or some iron containing products that uh, you have to apply these about once every 20 days, but these will get rid of dandelions and thistle and those kind of things uh, growing in your lawn. Um, they're expensive, they're time consuming, but they can work pretty well. You spray them and then within about an hour, the weed looks dead, but you're gonna have to spray it probably in another couple of weeks and then maybe another time after that. Um, so, uh, but eventually you can use them with these iron containing products. Um, I think I'm, a, you know, we always encourage spot treating. Um, so don't spray your entire lawn. Um, if you only got one or two weeds, you know, either dig those out or do, do spot spraying with those ready to use products. Um, the same thing with a granular weed and feed. If, you, if you've got um, just one or two weeds, don't put a weed and feed out on the entire lawn. It just doesn't make sense to put that herbicide everywhere. Um, do some spot treatments to get control of those weeds. Okay, so I see my time is up. Um, and I will, uh, let's see, let's see, there might be a couple questions in chat. I don't see anything. Um, so if there are any questions anyone uh, has, I'll, I'll honor your time and, um, and uh, quit here. I had some, just some animal problems I was gonna talk about, but, uh, and I'm more than happy to do that if people wanna stay on. And I can go for about another 10 minutes um, or I can quit right now. So I'll let you folks decide. You can, uh, you can vote on whether you want me to finish and hear about critters in your lawn or uh, uh, you can go and have your late lunch, unless you've been eating lunch while I was talking. Tony, I think it might be nice if you want to go ahead and continue. This recording will be available on YouTube for those who can't stay with us for another 10 minutes, we can just encourage them to check back later. Um, but I think, yeah, if you want to go ahead and finish and folks can always reference it again if they can't stay on. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, there'll be about 10 more minutes. I just want to talk about, and I think people will find this interesting and revealing, is um, some of the uh, uh, animal problems that we have in lawns. And we do, 
these can be very annoying problems in Colorado law. And so first one I want to talk about is dog urine. Um, uh, dog urine, um, if you have a dog, this is not an unusual sight this time of year. As lawns come out of dormancy or they're still struggling to come out, you, you, you often find these really bright green rings and then a dead center, okay? Um, and not all dogs kill grass. Some dogs just cause the green spots. Um, so, and it's not breed specific. It's not, it's not just female dogs. You've sometimes heard that. That's a, a myth. Um, and really what it is, is in urine, um, uh, a researcher at uh, North Dakota State University has actually discovered this, that uh, there is a, a component or a, 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 a chemical, if you will, that, that dogs, some dogs produce in their urine that acts like a herbicide and uh, kind of like Roundup, and it actually will kill uh, the grass. So, so the obvious solution or well, to me anyway, the obvious solution is to train your dog to use a, like a mulched area or a gravel area uh, for urination. Uh, that's easier said than done. If your dog is very food motivated, um, uh, that can be a pretty easy training thing. Um, but otherwise, there's not a whole lot you can do. Uh, some people will follow their dog around and, and spray the spots where the dog urinates. And actually, that will help prevent this. Um, but that's where the dog has trained you as the owner instead of you training the dog. So, uh, but that can work. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot you can do uh, for these spots. There's no miracle cures. The stuff that's sold in garden centers promising to get rid of the spots doesn't work. Um, so this is a, a dog training opportunity for you. Uh, another common problem in home lawns, um, particularly in the Western US in Colorado is is uh, night crawlers or earthworms. And uh, I just had a group, uh, I was given a tour of the, uh, the oval the other day for some folks from out of state. The oval is filled with night crawlers and earthworms, which is, and generally it's a good thing because they aerate the soil. If you have night crawlers in your lawn, you will never have thatch. You'll never have to power rake your lawn if you have night crawlers. The downside is they make the lawn really, really lumpy and bumpy and uneven. And for some people that, or many people, they don't care about that. Well, and they just, they're just curious, why is my lawn so bumpy? And it's from night crawlers. And that's because they use the same burrows over and over again, kind of like prairie dogs. And a night crawler can live to be two or three years old. So they're using the same burrows for a long period of time. And so they come up and they, they're castings, uh, worm poop, if you will, uh, is around the opening. Uh, they're always cleaning the soil out of their out of their, uh, uh, their tunnels. And so that creates the little mounds in, in the lawn, okay? So um, that causes bumps. Here's some more pictures. And if you look really closely at those bumps, you can almost always see where the hole is, where the, the night crawler. And, and so what they do is they come out at night and they forage, they look for organic matter, they look for grass clippings and, and leaves and, and so that's what uh, that's what this 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 guy's doing, is and they they'll pull those bits of of organic matter and leaves and whatever down into their holes and consume them um, uh, during the day. So all of that causes the lumpiness. Um, you know, as far as what you can do, there's not a whole lot you can do for these. Um, you know, you can power rake your lawn to kind of shave the top off. You can roll your lawn with a really heavy roller to kind of squish those, those mounds, but it's a very temporary fix. Uh, there's no pesticides to apply to kill night crawlers. So, um, so we really don't have any, any cures or solutions for, for this. Probably the best thing is to mow your lawn really tall. Um, so it's, uh, you don't feel the bumps as much as if you're mowing it really short. Another uh, animal uh, that causes damage on lawns in Colorado is uh, are rabbits. And a lot of times people don't realize this. They see rabbits in their lawn, but they don't connect them with, uh, with the damage that you, you get from rabbits. And, and so it's a combination of um, a feeding. They mow the grass really short. They, they eat it. They crop it off close to the soil surface. And their urine, like dog urine, can be very toxic. 
um, and they feed in the same place over and over and over. They're very habituated to, uh, to feeding in the same spots. Um, so that combination often ends up killing, uh, killing grass. People say, well, I don't see rabbits on my lawn. And it's like, well, they're probably out there at night because generally rabbits are nocturnal uh, because being a rabbit and running around during the day is an invitation to uh, being caught by a hawk or some kind of animal. But uh, at night, it's just as bad. It's, it's owls at night. Uh, but this is a picture I took in Boulder uh, on a lawn uh, showing all the rabbits that are present in the lawn. And they're just out there feeding uh, right at right at, right at night. So this is the type of, of uh, damage. This is rabbit injury on a home lawn. Um, and what they do is they live uh, undercover, and then they come out and at night and they feed and they kill parts of the lawn. Um, so what can you do? Uh, exclusion is the best uh, is the best solution. I think I have pictures here. So putting fencing up, and this is why you see a lot of people with fencing. So they've got a fence, a wood fence or metal fence, but then they've got this smaller hardware cloth or other type of fencing. And that is used to keep rabbits um, out of their lawn. Uh, sometimes motion detectors work okay, but the rabbits get used to that. Um, spraying stinky stuff on the lawn like uh, fox urine and coyote urine. I don't know if that works very well might keep neighbors away but um it really doesn't seem to bother the rabbits um so exclusion is always uh, one of the best uh, 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 uh preventions but i'll show you another one after we talk about voles here so voles um cause damage to lawns uh, most especially during the winter so some of you may have experienced this in your home lawn where you parts of your landscape where you get a long lasting snow cover. And especially if that snow cover is adjacent to like a juniper bed or a natural grass area, maybe you live on a green belt in an HOA, um, the voles will come out of the green belt areas and, and uh, burrow under the snow and they make these tunnels or trails um, and they're eating the grass all winter in these trails. Um, but they don't go away in the summer. So they still, they're still around in the summer. Um, but during the winter, they'll live under junipers and then they'll, they'll girdle junipers. So you get this flagging, these dead branches and junipers. That's from voles feeding on, on the junipers. Uh, but even during the summer, you'll get voles. So here's a, a lawn in Fort Collins here where they had uh, a huge population of voles in their landscape. They were living in the really tall grass, the bordering, the, the shortcut lawn. So the voles lived here, but then they would come out and feed on this grass because this is the irrigated, nice, tender, juicy, tasty grass. Whereas this grass isn't watered as much and it's a little, doesn't taste as good to the voles apparently. Um, but one thing you can do is you can trap these with uh, simple mouse traps. And I would put two mouse traps facing uh, opposite directions in these trails. And you don't even have to bait the mouse traps. Um, the, the, the voles are so used to using these trails, they'll just, they'll, they'll set the trap off just by walking on the trail but if you want if it feels better to put peanut butter on there it probably doesn't do anything but um they'll you know it's basically they run into the trap and, and they get caught so so trapping is a is a, a viable option but here's something else that works so this works on rabbits and voles actually there's a fertilizer called milorganite this is a uh, uh, made in Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Sanitary District. So this is sewage sludge. This is waste product from the Milwaukee Sanitary District, uh, human waste and everything else that gets you know, put down uh, toilets and that kind of thing. Um, but in any case, um, it is um, composted, it's, it's dried, it's perfectly sanitary at this point. There's no worry about you know, hepatitis or any kind of other diseases in this uh, product. And it's been sold. Uh, they're going, I think they're going on their 80th birthday now of being sold by Milwaukee. So it's great fertilizer. But the thing about this is it's got a, an aroma and odor, which you will notice the day you open the bag and apply it. It's, a, it's not a, a terrible smell, but it's kind of earthy, if you will. Um, 
but rabbits and voles apparently do not like this this um, aroma and uh, anecdotal research not quite duplicated or replicated but very reliable all across the United States, including but including with some of our master gardeners here in Colorado. Um, pretty darn convincing evidence that you put this on your lawn regularly. And by regularly, I'm saying probably about every other month, um, starting in, in starting in March. And so now I said don't fertilize very much in the spring and don't fertilize in the summer, but this is a very slow release product, very safe any time of the year. And it will discourage those voles and rabbits um, in your lawn. And basically what they do is they move to the neighbor's lawn. So you can say that's not being very neighborly, um, but you can suggest this fertilizer to your neighbors too. And it's, uh, it's really good at discouraging uh, rabbit and vole activity. And some people tell me that if it's not real high pressure, that deer uh, will actually, you know, avoid your lawn. Um, and, and feed on stuff in other people's lawns. So I won't vouch for the uh, for the uh, the deer repellency, but uh, uh, the 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 uh, vole and rabbit repellency is is pretty darn convincing. Um, so last thing I want to leave you with is there's lots of good information um, on our extension website, uh, just extension.colostate.edu. Um, uh, we've got a, a, a a website called Plant Talk. If you just if you just Google Plant Talk, all one word, it'll go to the website. And our Master Gardener website, the entire Master Gardener curriculum, um, is is on that website, and it's free to you uh, to, to to download and print if you want, or just read online. And it's got every landscape topic you can think of, from trees to tomatoes and veggies and uh, raspberries and lawns and flowers, every, whatever you want to grow uh, between Plant Talk and the Master Gardener website. Um, it's, it's, I guarantee it's covered somewhere there. Um, so great sources of information if you have questions about other parts of your landscape uh, besides your lawn. So, um, oh, and I would tell you about this blog too. So we have got a blog, it's called the Cohorts Blog. Um, and if you like watching webinars, we've got a tab on there that, that it's, it's called webinars. Um, and since COVID began, since the whole lockdown um, back in, in early 2020, um, we, we've been putting webinars uh, on gardening. And so virtually every, every topic you could think of, we've got webinars on orchids and veggies and uh, just everything you can think of. There's just probably not a topic that hasn't been addressed on our webinars. They're all free um, and it shows the upcoming ones as well. So um, we've got like a library series and we've got one being taught tomorrow on irrigation, landscape irrigation that uh, Allison O'Connor is teaching. Um, so if you just go there, you can register on that, from that blog for all of the future ones and you can watch all of the past ones. Um, so you thought you thought uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime was uh, binge worthy. You should see this website. You you can you can watch hundreds of hours of, of horticultural stuff on uh, on our our cohorts uh, uh, blog. So so now I am finished. And if there are any questions, I don't see any questions. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, for listening in and, uh, and again remind you of my email address or my cell phone number. Yeah, call me crazy, but uh, taxpayers pay for that cell phone number, so you have the right to call it. So, uh, so give me your questions, give me your weed pictures, uh, give me your questions, and uh, I'll try to answer those as, as well as possible. So, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for uh, for listening, and since it's an alumni broadcast. Go Rams. Go Rams is right. Thank you so much, Tony. We really appreciate your time. Thank you everyone who joined with us today, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday.